frontman Ian Brown walked with a Mancunian swagger and surrounded himself with bandmates who were equally cocky. We always had amazing pants and great haircuts. Bunch of absolute cheeky monkeys. 100% uh, arrogant, self-confident, great musicians, born to do it. So that's what we did, man. The Roses never apologised for their arrogance. They declared themselves the best band in the world and had little time for the indie music that had come before them. The independent scene's a joke, isn't it? No good music come out of it, really. Hardly any. Not England, anyway. Manchester in the area, we're in the National Cup Hello! In 1989, the Stone Roses gave indie music a completely fresh start. That summer, they began limiting their British performances to one-off spectaculars. The first of these was a legendary concert at the Empress Ballroom in Blackpool's Winter Gardens. The idea of the Steroids playing Blackpool is great anyway, because, it, because you know, if you're going to be big in a band, you have to go make it in London, and, and the Steroids have always been such a Manchester band, and going to Blackpool for your day out is such a Manchester thing, you know, it's, it was, that's what you did, you know, and to go and do this, this big breakthrough gig in Blackpool, drag the whole London up to it, it's, it's perfect. Blackpool was a gamble. Outside of Manchester, the band had struggled to fill venues holding just a couple of hundred people. The Empress Ballroom held a crowd of over 3,000. I was considered like doing gigs as being like, like walking a tightrope, you know, you could fall off at any moment in time, but we just enjoyed the danger of trying to overreach ourselves and just see exactly how far we could, uh, could stretch things, you know. Book places that we knew we couldn't possibly fill, just to see if we could. Probably about eight or nine coaches went down from Manchester and I, I was on one of them and it was just a really funny uh, experience on the way down and then a, a fantastic gig. Empress Ballroom was, it just like suddenly all these kids turned up and, and everyone got it, you know, it's it was you stood there right on the cusp of a wave of a whole new pop movement. But the band knew it, they knew they had the moment, you know, it's uh, it wasn't just another gig, it was the, the moment was there, the band grasped it. the biggest band on the planet, or in Great Britain at least. And it was a springboard to knowing we were going to achieve what we set out to do. We, we kind of moved it up a gear from playing like the smaller club things. It was just amazing. I remember Ian had this T-shirt on with a load of burnt five pound notes on his neck. And uh, it just, they just sort of commanded the stage really well. And um, just the atmosphere was amazing. I think it's got a sprung dance floor as well there, so everyone was kind of bouncing up and down. The finale of the sellout show was I Am The Resurrection, the band's show-stopping anthem where Ian Brown proclaims his own divinity. The song's instrumental climax turned the gig into an enormous rave. That crossover with the, the world of dance music was one of the great things about the Stone Roses too. The fact that you could dance to these 
records and clubs as well. That, that was so revolutionary. And if you listen to that long section at the end of I Am The Resurrection, it is built and it builds up and then drops and builds up and it drops like a good dance floor track does. And it's those techniques that are often forgotten by rock and roll bands and indie bands, the fact that you've got to give space. The Stone Roses seem to be the first band to like kind of take that energy and, and yeah, get you dancing. We were always a pretty funky band anyway, you know, they're the blackest white guys on the planet. And, you know, I think we had more people dancing there than the fucking Labour Party conference ever did. You know what I mean? That was our political manifesto, get people there, get them off the tits and give them a good night out, man. Blackpool transformed the Stone Roses into the hottest indie band in Britain, and the big time beckoned. What the Roses did was they made it look like the best thing in the world to be a successful band. They made it look like better than being a footballer, better than playing for England. Once Blackpool had happened, the world was ready for them. What the world is waiting for, that was the Stone Roses. Now the media spotlight fell on Manchester, helping the careers of the Roses' contemporaries, in particular the Happy Mondays and their unique brand of Northern Funk. For a few years, what became known as Manchester was the pop culture capital of Britain. The whole of the Manchester scene in the late 80s, that came about because of the attitude of independence. And some of the bands that are maybe a little more forgotten from that time, like a band like the Spiral Carpets, for example, they were at, at the heart of that. And I always loved their approach, like doing it themselves, like sticking out their own records. It's, it seemed to be kind of at odds at, with the rest of the world. I was working for Spiral Carpets in, in their office and I used to go on the road with them and I was kind of part of their road crew. And it was just, the thing about that scene, it became known as the Manchester scene, is nobody knew what the fuck they were doing. Everybody was just having a great fucking time. It was like punk, really, you know, you were, you were, you were kind of part of it and things were happening that, that have never happened since. It was just, it was kind of wild, you know, it was fucking brilliant. The Manchester sound was soon everywhere, and everyone wanted a piece of the action. Young pretenders, Blur, were on a record label backed by the major EMI, who ensured that the new group had the sound of the moment. Blur were first around when, when the Manchester so-called baggy thing was still going on. And fairly cynically, I think, there's no other way it had been made with that in mind. I know that their record label were quite keen that they kind of cashed in. So it had this big thumping breakbeat on it, the classic baggy boom, chick a dunk a dunk -ch kind of rhythm. We all hated the Stone Roses at the time, but the record company, who just, you know, paid for a record and a video, wanted to get their money back. So they were like, well, look, you can't have, like, backwards drums, that's stupid. Get these drums, like the Stone Roses. They sell loads of records. There's No Other Way was a top ten hit, but lead singer Damon Albarn was still a long way from finding his own voice. I mean, the only way I can kind of explain it is by saying I wasn't ready, really, to be uh, making music. I don't think, really, I would kind of really class myself as a songwriter then. It's like one or two little... just one or two good songs, but I just wasn't confident enough to really write. As Blur's career was just starting, the fortunes of the Stone Roses had taken a downward turn. Caught in a web of contractual wrangling and litigation, the band was running out of steam. <laughs> 